I guess all of you guys are unmanned aerial systems enthusiasts or fly drones have them, are interested in them. So I'll try to keep it at a drone's eye perspective a little bit. Uh, we'll get a little bit into the hardware but not too far so that we don't stray away from what I'm trying to show you guys. So um, we're talking about flying computers which is what all the multi-copters that we're uh, interested in are act really are. They are flying machines. And so one of the things I tell my students all the time is engineering is about trade-offs. You have to pick one thing, you optimize one thing, it comes at the expense of something else. Almost everything in the real world comes as a trade-off. So, uh, what's the biggest trade-off in flight in terms of stability? Uh, speed, I'm going for s even more. Speed has a lot to do with it. Wait. 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 Yeah, that's exactly right. So maneuverability or agility comes at the cost of stability. A stable aircraft is often not one that you're going to find doing flips and cool tricks. Conversely, an aircraft that is unstable is not one that is easy to fly. Uh, we all know the F-22 series of aircraft uh, that is uh, employed by the Air Force. Uh, that craft is not human pilotable. Uh, it has control systems that make 11 to 20 adjustments per second to the control surfaces independently of what the stick position is. Uh, so that aircraft is so unstable in order to permit it uh, incredible flight characteristics. So we get the same with multi-copters. Uh, and the really interesting thing about the multi-copter, which is what you already know, is that uh, we use multiple rotors to control the attitude and, um, uh, and height and yaw of the, of the aircraft itself. The other interesting thing is that it requires a computer. How many of you guys think that if you had four sticks, one for each motor, you could keep the thing level? Okay, we have a couple interesting people. Yeah, uh, no, you couldn't. Uh, and the reason why is because the aircraft is maintained stable by over 60 to 120 calcula or, um, attitude adjustments per second. Now, motors themselves have a lot of inertia, and so we know that they don't like changing speed very often. But if you change them fast enough and still allow, their, uh, allow for inertia, you can actually get some very stable fl flight characteristics. Anybody here actually built their drone uh, from the ground up? Okay, how many of you guys have tuned a PID controller before? Okay, so uh, how many of you guys had your PID controller super stable as soon as you pulled it out of the box? That should be nobody. <laughs> okay, maybe one. Um, and so we know that that aircraft like this are inherently unstable and that's what makes them amazing to fly. That's what gives them hover capabilities because we have rotating wings and that's what gives them the ability to uh, fly in the race course that you'll see outside. So quick design characteristics uh, that we think about when we think about these multi-copter aircraft. Of course we have power constraints. Everything comes down to trade-offs again. Uh, what is your power source? Is it a battery? Is it a fuel source? Is it something else? Uh, and what's your weight that it that, uh, that that contributes to your aircraft. Again, uh, you might get longer flight time, but poorer flight characteristics. Uh, we all know about light poly batteries uh, and other um, uh, fuel sources. Anybody fly nitro? Not for a quadcopter, obviously, but anybody fly nitro aircraft? Nobody flies nitro aircraft. There's a good reason for that. It's really messy, it's stinky, and it gets all over everything. Uh, not to mention that uh, on one of my earlier trainer aircraft, I had a significant problem with flame outs. And so the aircraft uh, would lose power right in the middle of a flight. And there's no restarting the engine once it goes out. And then our propulsion choices. Uh, we're all used to brushless DC motors, or brushless AC motors, depending on your perspective of it, uh, where we have to use electronic speed controllers uh, to um, provide the, the power of the motor. Anybody know how the actual speed controller knows the speed of the motor as it's rotating? Yeah, it's the Hall effect. Anybody heard of the Hall effect? So as one of the motor magnets moves around um, one of the stationary coils, it induces an electromagnetic field, and that's called back EMF. And the speed controller can actually measure that back EMF and correctly regulate the speed of the motor. So that's one of the ways that speed controllers work. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we also know that uh, there are internal combustion engines. Again, these are not the kind that you see on quads. Now, my research lab actually doesn't use quads very much. Any ideas why? Yeah, battery life. So battery life, obviously restricted with multi-copter aircraft. 
My research lab uses uh, fixed wing aircraft with both uh, gas and electric propulsion uh, because we can maintain a multi-hour flight time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's a, yet a third classification, uh, turbine, and these especially you will not find on quads. Uh, you can find these on your $50,000 jets. Uh, anybody ever seen a uh, jet hit a tree with one of these? Yeah, it goes up in a fireball. Fortunately, not one of my aircraft. I wish I had a turbine aircraft, but uh, that's just too pricey of a hobby. All right. So, let's talk about sensors. So, I'm talking about flying computers. That's what drones are. Uh, what gives you a kind of an understanding of, uh, of your world? That's what sensors do. Anybody know this board here? Anybody ever worked with a Pixhawk 4? Okay, it's a pretty common autopilot, open source. Uh, you can get many, many, many clones of it now. Well, this is the uh, main board from Pixhawk 4, and it comes with several sensors on board. I know it's on my slide, but anybody have ideas of what kind of sensors we want on our aircraft? Yeah, gyro. That tells us the attitude. It tells us the rotation rate of the aircraft. Okay, good. Uh, what else? Yeah, why do I want a barometer? Yeah, minute altitude difference. GPS tells you about your altitude, but it's really error prone. Your uh, vertical accuracy on GPS can be off by as much as 100 feet, and if you're trying to land with that, as we all know, that may not go so well if you're 100 feet off. So barometer gives us the stability uh, of, uh, of altitude adjustment and understanding where we are, okay? Um, We've talked about magnetometry. Why does magnetometer? Why is magnetometer useful? No, we ha we need to know our relative orientation, or sorry, our absolute orientation with respect to the Earth, and a magnetometer is the only thing that can do that. Uh, we use microelectromechanical switches uh, that orient themselves with respect to magnetic fields, and they create an analog output signal that we can measure and understand uh, as position. And something that is becoming more and more common is proximity sensing, whether using infrared, whether using computer vision. Uh, proximity sensing is a way that we understand our world. And GPS, I don't list as a sensor. It's not really a sensor, it's a radio. It permits uh, triangulation. Uh, we've all seen... <clears throat> How many of you guys uh, work with uh, KK boards? NASE boards? Uh, CC3Ds? None of the above? Okay, what, what are you guys' favorite boards? Uh, F4 and F7 boards. Okay. What about, yeah. Okay. Well, they're all similar variations to each other. They feature a microcontroller. They feature a set of accelerometers and gyros. And we integrate that information over time. Um, anybody know what PID stands for, actually? We've all tuned PID on our quads before. What does it actually stand for? Yeah, proportional integrative, and derivative. So here's the thing. We've all heard PID, and we've tried to figure out what it means, but few people actually really down to the brass tacks understand what the different terms mean. So if I got a controller, proportional is how far off I am from my stick input versus where the craft is, or how it should be adjusting. Integrative tells me over time how fast that error is accumulating. In other words, if I have my stick over here and the aircraft is still not responding, proportional is not enough. So integrative starts racking up that error over time and then responding. So if it's still not getting where you need it to go, the integral component is what will respond to that and get you over to, to correct the error. So it's cumulative over time, the error. The derivative component is, at least in multi-copter flight, a less important bit uh, it's super important in other process control systems where PID is used. By the way, PID is used in almost every uh, uh, process control technology or at least uh, anything that requires position uh, and orientation uh, control. The derivative component prevents massive overshoot. So as the integrative portion is tracking your error over time, the derivative says, okay, I'm now approaching the resolution of the error. Let's not overshoot this thing. Because if you have too much integral, we've all seen a copter that does this. That's too much integral. Uh, or it could also be proportional. So tuning these things is far for, is, if, it's both an art and a science. Uh, but now we have a little bit more understanding of what P, I, I and D do. Uh, and if you're tuning multi-copters, the P and the I are your most important 
uh, functions that you can do. And the gains is what we used to adjust that. So how does this work? We take sensor data in. A microcontroller on, on one of your uh, boards is able to understand the data. It has intended stick position uh, and therefore attitude. And then it, from that, it infers how far off it is. These are inputs into the PID controller. And the output is to the speed controllers that say, hey, how much do we need to adjust the attitude of the aircraft? Or really, that's still in the microcontroller. And then the microcontroller triggers the speed controllers to get the aircraft where it needs to be. OK? So this is performed in two loops. There's an inner loop and an outer loop. And uh, you tune uh, the PID gains so that uh, your attitude adjustment versus stability are working exactly the way they need to. Okay? This is not an easy thing. And there's a reason quadcopters didn't exist until about the 2000s. Not really, there weren't really much before that. Why? Microcontrollers didn't really exist. Accelerometers were not ubiquitous. You have accelerometers in your pocket right now on your phone. You have multiple sensors. You have more sensors than your quad does. Okay? You do have barometers in here, by the way. Uh, they're just not constantly employed. Um, the tech that makes these microcontrollers small, affordable, and low power consumption just didn't exist. And so if we take these MEMS accelerometers, the microcontrollers, and then some of the more advanced speed controllers, that's what gets us to the flying computers phase. Um, how many of you guys ha are, well, so I, I teach in computer engineering, computer science at UofL, that's my department, and one of the classes that we teach is microcontrollers. Uh, and when I took over that class, we were actually working with some tech from the 1980s. And that tech possessed memory, uh, a whopping amount of memory, 256 bytes of memory, okay? Uh, and those microcontrollers were expensive, they were bulky, used a lot of power. Now you can get them in really tiny form factors, size of a grain of rice. You could run it for thousands of years on a battery in sleep mode. And uh, more importantly, they have tons of onboard memory. And by tons, I mean two to four kilobytes, which is more than plenty for what most people need to do. Uh, we've talked about a little bit of some of the attitude adjustment. What about y'all? I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about y'all. How does a quadcopter figure out? We know that it's, it's simple. If you have a quad and you need to change um, attitude, you just spin up a pair of motors and they're counter-rotating blades, and you drop maybe the speed of the others. And I did, of course, bring a quad with me. Anybody seen a Mavic Air? Anybody have one of these? These are incredible little aircraft. I have a little bit of a pitch about them in a little bit. But as we know, uh, we can adjust our attitude by adjusting the speed of these counter-rotating motors as needed. What about yaw adjustment, though? How does that happen? Okay, so Newton's laws of motions uh, apply here. If I've got a, a, a spinning propeller, which is essentially a rotating wing, it's acting on the air. True or false, the air is acting back on the prop. True. So that's causing what kind of uh, motion in physics? It's causing torque, or it's causing a force in a rotational direction. It's causing torque. So if the prop is acting against the air to produce lift, the air is pushing back against the prop, you're going to get torque in a particular direction. And that's why helicopters have to have you know, a second fan blade at the back to stabilize themselves. Otherwise, they would start spinning uncontrollably. So quads can make use of this. And this is perhaps one of the most ingenious things about quad rotor design. It's not just that we can do attitude adjustment. We can do yaw adjustment. And the way we do that is by spinning down one pair of complementary rotors and spinning up the other pair so that we stay at the same altitude, but we're, we're leveraging that torque as it, as it starts rotating around the aircraft. So uh, that is one of the magic things of uh, using these little microcontrollers. Keep the same altitude, get the feedback from the sensors, keep the same altitude, but rotate the aircraft around its axis. OK. Any questions so far? This is probably stuff you guys already know. That's all right. You're an enthusiast crowd. OK, good. So let me talk to you a little bit. So I'm not a DJI rep. Uh, I have a DJI craft. Uh, there are other, plenty of other drones out there, but this is just one of my more rec recent uh, aircraft. 
<clears throat> uh, we do build in my lab. We uh, have custom aircraft. We 3D print them. Um, so we kind of have our own custom setups for longer distance aircraft. But this little $800 craft uh, is perhaps uh, a, almost a model, or sorry, a marvel of modern engineering. And the reason why is for $800, you get a self-leveling multicopter. Okay, everybody can do that. You can do that for 15 bucks. Okay, but then we start adding opti obstacle sensing and avoidance. This, uh, this aircraft has no fewer than, than eight cameras on board. It's got six stereoscopic cameras for obstacle avoidance and detection and tracking, front to back uh, and top to bottom, uh, actually just a bottom mounted set, and then it's got infrared cameras as well to measure uh, proximity. So that is integrated and let me tell you, have, have any of you guys ever worked with uh, computer vision algorithms like OpenCV? All right, probably nobody. There's a reason why, it's hard stuff. And so for one of these aircraft to avoid running into the wall, uh, takes some pretty amazing amount of computational effort and uh, computer vision applications. Uh, it folds into something the size of your cell phone, it uses even some rudimentary machine learning al algorithms, and it does that to do its active tracking. That's right, you can make motions with your hands, it'll recognize them, it'll zoom in and out. Uh, it does that through rudimentary computer uh, machine learning algorithms. And to top that off, it includes a 4K camera with a pretty amazing gimbal on it. it has less than 0 0.005 degrees per second of vibration, which is absolutely incredible. Again, this is 800 bucks. If you had built this about two or three years ago, this would have run you a couple hundred grand for the kind of tech that's in it now. I would say maybe about three years ago. Uh, in fact, five years ago, I flew an aircraft that was not as capable of this. Uh, that was, I think, retailing for about $120,000. Um, and comes nowhere near to this. The only advantage it had was battery life was about 50 minutes, which is unheard of at the time. Okay, this has a two mile range. It does use Wi-Fi, which is not ideal, uh, but it works well. And a 21 minute flight time, again, 800 bucks, a lot of sensors on board. Let me talk to you a little bit about those. Uh, of course, we know that DJI has kind of cornered the market on consumer scale UAVs. Um, others exist, um, but either in low cost versions or in competitors. Now there's some really interesting drone startups out there, uh, but the market is incredibly tough to break into. Anybody seen D DJI's new proposed building that they're going to build? It has two enormous skyscrapers with a sky bridge from which they're going to be launching these aircraft. It's pretty insane. That's how much money they're bringing in. They can build billion dollar buildings. <laughs> um, so U.S. manufacturers are, are, of course, outgunned on cost, reliability, engineering software. I will say it is hard to find a commercial quad that is more stable than a DJ, DJI aircraft. They've gotten their PID control down so well, they use uh, multiple sensors uh, in case there's any kind of a failure or a disagreement. Um, I have quite a number of craft, and there's just not much more stable than one of these, uh, or at least one of their bigger ones. Okay. So what makes this thing fly? So we talked about sensors and the, the kind of sensors that you might find available in some of these aircraft. This has not just microcontrollers. We've used microcontrollers because they're reliable, they're low power, they're strong enough to handle the sensor data, integrate it, and turn it into usable uh, control signals. This thing goes ahead and takes it a step up. This uses multiple microprocessors. It uses a multi-core CPU architecture to handle not just the flight control and dynamics, but also the image processing, the computer vision, um, to, to take all the uh, sensory integration data from the multiple stereoscopic cameras on the front, the back, the bottom, and the infrareds. It builds a picture and a model of your flight environment, which is really amazing. Um, of course, it's got its primary gimbal-mounted 4K camera, uh, dual accelerometers in case one of them fails and they actually use that as reference points with each other. Um, if you have a, a cell phone or an updated game controller they have what's called a six axis accelerometer which uses multiple accelerometers and gyros with reference to each other that gives you absolute position information or sorry relative position information but it allows you to track minute differences rather than just big ones. Uh, it's got dual gyroscopes, as I've mentioned, dual magnetometers. Uh, magnetometry is important, 
and figuring out where north is is important. As we all know, uh, if you don't know which way your drone's flying, you're going to have a hard time controlling it and you might fly it into a tree. Okay. Uh, now these aircraft are harder to fly into trees because they can see them, uh, except for sideways. Um, it has redundant barometers. Altimetry is very important when these aircraft are trying to land. We don't want to hit the ground too hard, so we have some proximity detection for the ground. But barometric pressure tells us a lot about very minute adjustments in altitude. Uh, advanced navigation software, there's no question about that. Uh, it's got motors whose speed controllers actually have sinusoidal output. Now what that means is that typically a, sp a speed controller uses a square wave output. Okay? And it causes the motor to pulse. And because it has a lot of inertia, the square wave gets averaged out by the motor to be relatively continuous. But there's a drawback. Remember, I keep saying engineering is about trade-offs. The drawback is that that pulse square wave causes noise, like audible noise. And so it, those tiny little impulses get registered in the frame of the aircraft, and you can hear it really well. This aircraft uses sinusoidal output, which is much harder to do uh, with a digital system. It requires some approximation. Uh, I actually teach a whole section of this in my microcontrollers class, not specifically to aircraft, but about, um, sinus, uh, about approximating continuous waveforms. And the important bit there is that the sinusoidal output really reduces the noise from the motor by not having these strong impulses that have to be buffered by the inertia of the motor. So that's another amazing little improvement. Is it a lot of improvement? No, but it's something that makes it better. And that's why these guys have the edge. It's got an integrated Wi-Fi access point. So if you didn't want to use the controller, you can actually just use straight up use your cell phone. It has an access point on here. It means it's hackable. It means you can turn this into a flying, um, you could turn this into a flying attack machine. That's right. Uh, and I actually have a paper on this uh, with a Parrot drone uh, aircraft series. Uh, you can load these guys up with a little bit of malicious software and man in the middle somebody's Wi-Fi network connection. It's a lot of fun. Or uh, you can pretend to be their Wi-Fi network connection. They'll authenticate to you and you can do whatever you want. Okay, fun stuff. Um, <clears throat> so integrated Wi-Fi access point is not just a client. Integrated cooling system, it has fans with variable uh, output uh, speed. Did I mention this is 800 bucks? Again, unbelievable. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but for the kind of tech that's on that, it's just unreal. It is absolutely unreal. All right, so we've talked about flying computers. Anybody have questions? <clears throat>